recording and share screen. All right, so welcome to another session of the Site Owner Academy. And this week we're talking about where clinical research is headed and where the money is going in 2020 and beyond. So a very uh, interesting year that we're being a part of. And um, the research industry is kind of going in a whole bunch of directions at the same time. So what do you think, Chris, of where the industry is headed before we get into these slides? Well, I mean, if I had the job, I would say it's probably back to where it was before the, you know, the COVID and everything else else was happening. With a slight difference, maybe a little bit more um, priority set towards remote monitoring and doing, being able to accomplish things remotely. A lesson mm -hmm. may have been learned where they need to be uh, well prepared should something like this happen again. And maybe they'll find that this is actually easier in the long run and, and less costly and might <clears throat> adopt this for all studies, potentially. Yeah, and this is primarily for the Site Owner Academy, but since we're putting it on YouTube and the podcast, mm -hmm. I want to hear the comments from people where you see the industry headed in 2020 uh, and beyond, because there's a lot going on at the same time. So, And, uh, you know, people may be seeing completely different things, and they both could be correct. This is, what, this is the kind of year that we're in. So the next slide, the future of clinical trials. Okay. So sponsors have seen the potential that both decentralized trials and virtual trials have. So by decentralized, you know, this term is being thrown around a lot, but it's basically the old way of doing trials was everything was kind of at the sponsor level, and then it would go to a site, and it would kind of be, like, the site would be the center point for the subject. And it still is that way in the majority of cases, but we've seen a small shift, and it's going to get bigger, even before the pandemic, with medications being shipped directly to patients' homes and mobile health care workers going directly to patients' homes. This will be an increasingly important area of research, but it's not going to, in my opinion, ever replace the site. Um, so, and then that's, you know, a decentralized trial is completely different from a pure virtual trial where there really is no site. You know, it's all done over something like Zoom or Skype. Um, uh, both trial forms help decrease the reliance on research sites. So these are, I mean, even before this pandemic, Chris and DIA, we were talking, I mean, this was like the hot topic for everybody, uh, at these places. Yep. Yep. It certainly was. Um, like and, every uh, booth was discussing this. What was that? I said, uh, every fifth, maybe tenth booth was discussing something along these lines. Yeah, decentralized, the virtual trial. Yep. Yeah. Uh, although sponsors would prefer these types of clinical trials, the reality is that clinical trials are not expected to change too drastically. So one of the biggest contributing factors is that clinical research has a branding problem. And this is true because if you, compl if you just remove the site, uh, you know, the majority of patients enroll in a study because someone at the site is also their clinician or their their healthcare worker in some capacity. So, you know, they have a relationship already. Uh, if you remove that aspect, who do you have? I mean, it's decentralized. So who do you have? You have the sponsor and you have no relationship sponsor really has no relationship with patients, nor are they even really allowed to necessarily have a relationship. So uh, there's a lot to unpack here, but I do think virtual and decentralized trials are going to increase, but I think the overall market share uh, of study or the overall study supply in general is also going to increase with it. And look, all you need is for something to change like 1% every year. 
to where if you extrapolate that over a 30-year period, like looking back, it seems like a lot because it's, it's just like compound interest. Right. You know, like, for example, the I'm reading a book now on global economy. It's called Capital. And, you know, the average country, once it's developed, so developed nations, like the wealthiest nations like U.S., Europe, uh, you know, those those places, Canada, uh, uh, Japan, these places, they they see an average growth rate every year of 1%. Whereas up-and-coming economies like Brazil, China, uh, India, you know, when they're, when they're playing catch-up, because all these nations are playing catch-up, you know, they're growing like at 6% a year. So when you look at 30-year period, even that 1% of growth, it makes such a huge difference when you look back from 30 years because it compounds. And so it's the same thing with this. Like even if clinical research just changes little by little, 1% every year, well, in 30 years, you're going to have a different industry. You know, it just happens slowly. Um, so that's, you know, all that to say that, hey, these things happen slowly, but the fundamental is that the clinical research has a branding problem, and about 90% of trials are always behind in enrollment. Always. And that's due to inclusion and exclusion criteria, the studies being made too difficult. What will be, uh, what be your thoughts on that? Uh, no. So that's part of it. But the main reason is getting the patients to be interested in joining in the study in the first place, like educating them on what, educating them on what research actually is. Because so, patients are not out there looking for, unless they're in oncology, patients are not necessarily looking for research options. And so like, decentralizing, just don't do that. so decentralizing Trials will not help with this respect with this uh, problem for certain. The problem with decentralized trials is how do you get patients informed about studies? Right. So you, know, you can't really run ads. Ads will be ignored. I mean, you know, a few people might think it's interesting and click on it, but that's not enough to make a dent. Ninety percent of trials are behind in enrollment. Right. So again, decentralized. Trials will not help with that ninety percent. If anything, it will make it worse. Um, if anything, it will make it worse. Instead of being ninety percent, instead of being ninety percent of them are behind on enrollment, we'll have now ninety five percent are behind on enrollment. Yeah, I could see that happening. I mean, it's just it's not going to get better, is what I think, unless right. we find a way to tap into social media somehow, and even then. Somebody has to educate the people on what clinical research is because most people don't know. Most people are not searching for that. So that's the problem. And it's dependent upon the type of decentralized trial. So um, it's, it's escaping me at the moment, but your DNA, uh, are you using your DNA, you spit in the tube, send it off. Um, that company, uh, 23 and me. Yeah, 23 yeah. and me. So that's a decentralized trial to a degree. Um, yeah, that's actually a decentralized trial, retrospective, because they can do a study on my DNA um, right. based on their technology improves. They can analyze, you know, my genome better. So something um, like that. Something like that's not difficult to get patients for. So it depends on the uh, no. trial. Right. That's just like an opt-in, you know, one time that you allow your, you know, uh, right. your genome to be studied. Uh, but you can't do much with that. I mean, anyone in who designs trials will know that you can't do much with that. Exactly. So, again, it's dependent upon the type of trial. So, if they're looking at doing a true phase three or phase two study this way, it's going to be very difficult to patient. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, slide three. The future of clinical trials. So, Future studies are expected to rely on technology uh, to make more tools available to sites and to improve workflow efficiency. So this is going to change research, even at the rate of 1% a year, although I think it's changing more faster rate than that. Um, e-source is a big thing that uh, I think could change monitoring. 
to some extent. Um, if you have electronic source and then you already have EDC and you have an algorithm or an AI good enough to do basic SDV, I don't think you'll need a CRA for SDV. I think you'll need CRA for higher level functions where the AI is not up there yet, not up to those capabilities yet. So, uh, you know, technology is going to make a huge impact in the workflow efficiency primarily, but it's not going to do anything with patient recruitment. We keep coming back to that. Yep. Uh, and that's the next point. Recruitment will likely struggle to keep up with study designs, which have become increasingly complex, which is what you said earlier. So studies are getting more complex, and recruitment is just going to get harder. You know, so the solution, I think, is we keep talking about this, is we need more research-naive physicians participating in research, becoming non-naive, becoming experienced in research. And this is what DSTS, one of the things we do. And uh, we're making our little impact, but, you know, for for the industry as a whole to benefit from this, there needs to be more of a concerted effort uh, from the industry as a whole. Uh, and the number of actively enrolling studies is expected to increase uh, due to delays caused by COVID-19. So that's in the near short term. You know, we're seeing that now. A bunch of studies yep. getting started right now. Yep. Uh, next slide. What sponsors are investing in? So there is increasing sponsor interest in studies relating to, and Chris, you're more in the day-to-day -day of looking at budgets and so you see what new studies are out there. But these are what I think are, you know, increasing interest from sponsors. is CNS, gastro, oncology, you get diagnostics, medical devices, and cannabidiol, C CBD. There's a lot of studies with CBD, actually. What do you think? What do you see that's not on here that should be on here? Um... I think that's fairly encompassing. I don't think there's anything I could add. Okay. Based on the top that's, of my head. That's what's kind of hot right now in the immediate short term. Uh, in the long term, nobody knows. I mean, but, you you know, these things take 10 years or so to get through phase one through approval. So if you're going to be in business planning the next decade, I mean, you're going to be seeing stuff in these areas. So. And sponsors are also looking for vendors who can assist with recruitment and analytics. So back to technology here. I mean, you know, we have yet to find a ideal patient recruitment vendor, right? Like there's plenty that can help with easy-to-enroll studies. There are very few, if any, that we found that can enroll for the more complicated studies, which, by the way, make up probably the majority of studies now. Oh. Um, there is one other item that we should add there that's very uh, obvious, and it should be pulmonology. Oh, okay, pulmonology. So that's another one that uh, that's one that did not make the slides, but will I will update the slides right now for the site owner academy. Okay, that's probably the hottest actually. Right now, yeah, because of COVID, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so last slide. a good time to be a generalist, right? And I talk about this a lot, but, uh, you know, I think it's become more evident now than ever before. So it's a great time to be a generalist in research because generalists tend to stick around when specialist jobs become scarce or become obsolete. Uh, if you work at a large CRO, you already have access to training for other therapeutic indications. You know, so going back to slide four, if you're a CRA at a bigger CRO, you can probably train yourself on these uh, other therapeutic indications if you don't have experience there. And you can get a little certificate that you can put on your CV that you have experience in that. Uh, if you uh, Trainings can be added to your CV. So generalists are strongly encouraged to network and emphasize the value they can offer because the industry is changing, even if it's gradual, although I don't think it's that gradual. 
you need to network to see what other people are doing and to see where the other opportunities lie because you may not be able to know where all the pain points are unless you talk to other people. And so that's uh, my two cents on this. Uh, Chris, anything else you want to add before we wrap up? No, I think that covers it well.